Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our monthly office hours for the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. I know that you folks have started a new year. We all wish the weather this week would have been during the summer, so we could have been able to enjoy it a little bit more. We know our educators and our students are hanging in there and being troopers and doing the very best that they can with this gorgeous sun outside their windows. So we appreciate you folks joining us today. As always, we will start with our team introductions. My name is Shelley Shasi jandro and I'm the Director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. We do encourage you as we start a new year to go ahead and put your name and email address as well as your school community right in the chat box. We're trying to create a network of peers and colleagues through the work that we do, and this is extremely helpful for all of us. Good morning, I'm Monique Sullivan and I am the AARP coordinator. Hi, I'm Karen Kuziak. I coordinated CARES. I'm coordinating uh, Carissa and work on some other special projects related to the use of the ESSER funds. Good morning, I'm Kevin Harrington and I'm the GEAR and EANS coordinator. Good morning, I am Maisha Asha. I am fiscal coordinator for ESSER funds. Good morning, I'm Deanna Roberts, management analyst. Good morning, I'm Terry Beal, Management Analyst. Good morning, I'm Natalie Owens with an S at the end, at, uh, and I'm the Procurement Analyst. So like usual, we just wanna give you a preview of the topics for today. We will be talking about the Carissa closeout and some important dates and timelines associated with being sure that funds are utilized and invoiced in a timely manner. We also are aware that there has been some transition in your staff and your leadership, and we want to be sure that all of our systems in regards to reporting and invoicing are up to date with that contact information, and we'll describe why it's so critical to be sure that that information is up to date. We also have some friendly reminders in regards to use of federal language. We also have some topics that we want to bring to your attention as uh, friendly reminders towards the end of our presentation today. As usual, we just wanna be sure that participants have the understanding and the knowledge to be sure that they're using ESER funds in the effective manner that is reasonable, necessary, and allowable under each of the funding sources, as well as in compliance with all federal requirements. So as I alluded, it's very important to be sure that your contact information superintendent, applicant coordinator, and business manager are up to date if you've seen any transition. One main reason that this is critical is when you are asking to have an application reopened, if you are not listed as the superintendent or the applicant coordinator, we are going to po pose more questions. We all know that our districts have a username and password for the applicant coordinators and our superintendents get a certification email so if the information on the right-hand side of the screen above the line is incorrect, your superintendent is not gonna get a notification that anything needs to be reviewed. In addition, we send communication through the GEM system and it utilizes the pre-populated information from the application for the superintendent contact information and the applicant coordinator's information. So if you've had a transition in any of those three roles that are critical when it comes to the ESER funding and federal funds in general, we are encouraging you strongly to go into both entities, the federal grant reimbursement system and each of the individual applications to update the information. And I say each of the ESER applications because they're independent of each other. So if you update the ARP application with the superintendent and applicant coordinator, but do not tend to update the ESER 2 or Carissa application, if we go into Carissa and send a note through GEMS, it will go to the improper person. So if your support in making sure that this information is up to date is greatly appreciated by members of our team. So I guess the news of the of the month anyway is that Carissa Easter 2 is um, ending. That shouldn't be big news. I, I expect 
most of our folks who are listening today understand that that is happening, that all of the funds for Carissa two, uh, Carissa Easter two should be need to be absolutely need to be obligated by September 30th, 2023. Um, and then you have until December 30th to invoice or liquidate those funds. You are not able to do that afterward. They're not going to be accessible after that. And uh, good, there are some bullet points that were put in there <laughs> because these are phrases. Thank you. Um, for the bottom part of the slide, just some facts that I pulled on, I think, Tuesday this week. 2.5, uh, 25.4 million of Carissa funds are still needing to be invoiced collectively uh, from among all the districts in the state. We had an award in Maine of $165.4 million for Carissa funds. 27 from my count, I just went right through and counted, of the SAUs have more than 30% that remaining that are that is remaining to be invoiced. So 30% of their allocation. And of course, um, the calendar. By my count, there were 23 calendar days left to obligate these uh, Carissa Esther 2 funds and about 119 days to invoice or liquidate those funds. So the question comes up, what do we mean by obligate? And, and I think we've printed this in a number of places in our newsletter. Uh, in, uh, we've sent it to emails and people have asked us about obligations. So we're citing right from uh, the, the uh, federal regulations. Uh, the table shows what it means to make an obligation under certain conditions. And the period for delivery of goods and services and exchange of funds can be extended to the end of the liquidation period only as a timely and valid obligation has been made. So here's the chart of the obligations. I'm not going to read the whole chart to you, but I'm going to point out the ones that I think are important for you to know about. A, if you're purchasing property, the date of the obligation is the date that there is a written agreement that you're going to be purchasing that piece of equipment or property. B, if you're paying for personal services by an employee of your own school district or of the state, the obligation is made when that person fulfills those responsibilities. However, this is distinct from C, if you're contracting with someone who is not an employee of your own school district or of the state and you want them to do some work, the obligation is made on the date that you agree that that person is going to provide a service for your school district. So that's distinct from B. Uh, I think another important one that often comes up here is, that I'll highlight is F for travel. The obligation is not made until travel happens. So I can give an example for this one. Uh, you can't obligate this month for uh, an opportunity when you're going to be sending your employees to a training or a conference into this fall after September 30th. That's not an obligation because um, the, the obligation wouldn't happen until that employee travels. And, and in this my scenario, the employee is not traveling until after September 30th. But all of these uh, A through H are in, uh, are in effect. I just highlighted the ones that more frequently come up um, in emails and conversations with folks out in the field. I just wanted to add a little piece, just one little piece about the uh, agreement. It has to be a binding written agreement or commitment, and it needs to um, include all of the pieces that would make a valid contract. And I say that because we did have a district who said they had a verbal agreement with a with um, a contractor, and that doesn't meet uh, federal guidelines when it comes to um, uh, a binding written agreement. So just keep that in mind as well. So the next one is about inventory items purchased with ESSER funds. Um, all property purchased and reimbursed with Carissa ESSER II funds must be properly inventoried. This is not a new concept. Um, most federal funds require um, some form of inventory for any kind of property that's purchased with federal funds. It is the responsibility of the SAU to have a procedure identified 
for tracking and identifying, uh, I'm sorry, an inventorying property purchased. Uh, the procedure must meet to CFR part 200, um, 302 BC, and then to CFR part 200, 319 C. Um, a physical inventory of the property must be completed and the results re reconciled with property records at least once every two years. And you can find that citation as well in the CFR um, code as well. Um, we are uh, really stressing this because we are having conversations with districts and we're just wanting to remind districts that you do need to inventory everything. Um, and this can include if you purchased a vehicle, if you purchased a bus, if you purchased a van, if you purchased, um, you know, items that you might have outside in your, you know, for your outdoor, um, you know, outdoor learning environment, like everything that you purchased with um, ESSER funds needs to be properly um, in, uh, inventoried and also keeping track of those records. And then, yeah, slide eight. And then to be more specific, this is what's written in Uniform Grant Guidance, physical inventory requirements. Again, this is not new for federal programs. It's just something that we want to um, reiterate because ESSER, a lot of items have been purchased with ESSER money, and we know more is going to be purchased um, as you know we still have one more year left of ARP. So it needs to have unique self-determined uh, uh, inventory number, item description, including make and model, each individual model and serial number to reflect the number of items purchased, vendor or source of purchase, acquisition date, cost per unit, Sorry about that. She just moved it on me, but I'll find that I'll keep going. Yeah. And then the physical location of the property and um, note any safeguarding measures um, of the property. And then we put down the bottom here and we know this may be kind of interesting for some of you, depending on the property that you purchased, but each item will need to be tagged with the inventory number, funding source, and the owner of the property. So we know that several districts have purchased buses, they've purchased vans, they may have purchased, um, you know, uh, gazebos or things like that for their outdoor learning. And I'm just naming a couple off the top of my head, but those items all need to be tagged um, and indicating what number, what their inventory number, how they were funded, um, and the owner of the property. And I know we had a conversation just recently. Well, we want to give credit where credit's due. It's not about giving credit. It's about Federal guidelines require that any property that's purchased with federal funds has to be tagged and follow these inventory um, requirements. So it's not us, the department or the U.S. Department of Education getting credit for this. It's what's written in uniform grant guidance. So that's just, and I know some of you, this is old, this is not anything new, but there's been a lot of things that are purchased, a lot of property being purchased with um, SR money. So it's just a really good reminder for all of us. And I'm also fielding a few independent questions in the chat box directly to me, but one in particular that I think is important to draw a little bit of attention to is when we say the word property, we're not talking about a house or a camper or a vehicle. When we talk about property in regards to federal funds, um, we are really talking about that threshold of $5,000 or more. So uh, in the Code of Federal Reg uh, Regulations equipment, which is also known as property, is has a threshold of $5,000 or more. So if there is an item that has cost you more than $5,000, you should be sure it's on an inventory and it's tagged accurately according to the regulations. So Monique alluded to this in her last um, slide in regards to the fact that we are not requesting this information because we want to be sure credit is given to where credit is due. However, it is one of these policies within the federal grant requirements of ESER funding. You may have noticed in your grant award notification that, that there is an attachment 
related to federally funded disclaimers. And that is essentially indicating that when a project, when an item, when something is procured for a project that is funded with ESER funds, when you're issuing any statements, press release, or bids, any of that type of information that you're putting out to the public and, and calling attention to it or getting information back from the public, you really want to be sure that you're describing the projects and that you are indicating that they were paid for in whole or part with federal funds. So again, there's attachment in your grant award notification and the top section of this slide is directly from that disclosure information in the grant award notification. And one of the three things that you really want to be sure that you're doing in regards to the federal funds, if you have a project that is being supported in, in part or in whole with federal emergency relief funds is being sure you have the percentage of the total cost that has federal funding associated with it, being sure that the dollar value of the project is denoted and also really weighing out the percentage and the do dollars associated with the total cost of, pro of the project. So we gave you a few examples that will give you a couple moments to, to look over, but essentially you can see the first example is a vehicle purchase that potentially was supported with ARP funding, for example, or uh, Carissa funding. And then a portion of it, because it wasn't only going to be used for a certain population that made it allowable within the ESER funding, they denoted that half of it was being funded with a non-governmental source. And that non-governmental source language is directly from the attachment of your grant award notification. And then again, we also make this disclaimer that the make the model does not represent any views or endorsements between the US Department of Ed, the government or ourselves, the state agency, the main Department of Education. The second example is something that was purchased to uh, increase communication through technology and the entire purchase was funded with ARP funds. And you can see that that notion, it may not be a percentage that you noticed in the example number one, but it, it indicates that it was fully funded with, with federal emergency relief funding. Again, denoting that there is no representation or any official endorsements from any of these entities. So we wanted to draw your attention to this because we do want you to tell your story. We do want you to promote the projects that you're doing. We just wanna be sure that you're providing this disclaimer when you're presenting those projects, when you're putting out the news press, when you're calling the media out to uh, come visit your outdoor classroom because it's doing great things, or when you're highlighting a new program that was funded with emergency relief funds this is, this is the disclaimer that we're talking about for the items in which you've procured uh, with federal in part or in whole emergency relief funding. So we wanted to draw your attention to an office hour that we are hosting as a Office of Federal Emergency Relief Team that is only going to be related to late liquidation extension. That office hour is going to be on September 19th at 11 a.m. And this is really an informational session to describe the required late liquidation extension application process for only Carissa ESER II funds. So there are just a couple things that I want to point out. This is not a tidings amendment like you may see in regards to title funds, where you have an additional year to utilize a particular source of funding. This late, li this late liquidation extension is a very rarely used provision within federal funding that indicates that if you've engaged in a binding written timely obligation by September 30th, 2023. And for some unforeseen circumstance, you're not able to submit and process 
and liquidate your funds by December 30th of 2023. There is an application process that you can uh, engage in and that application process would come to us and then would need to be reviewed by the US Department of Ed who would approve or deny that request. So again, just being sure that everyone on the call is aware that it is not additional time to utilize the funds. It is potentially on a rare circumstance, the ability to submit invoices with a greater timeline. But what I will do is once I transition to uh, another presenter, I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat box if one of my team members doesn't beat me to the punch. Thanks, Shelley. So um, if you're looking for us on the web, uh, you may have noticed that the whole Maine Department of Education has a new look to its website. All of the information is still there. It just might not be, it's not presented in the same format that you may be accustomed to. So we're bringing that to your attention. Um, if you find your way, if you're able to find your way right to the page, which is our, land, our Federal Office of Emergency Relief Programs uh, landing page, the address is right there, the URL. You'll see um, a notice in red about the um, ending of the Carissa funds. That should be no surprise now, but we want folks to know that. And, and then if you're looking for, oh, where's that information about allocations or where, where can I find a link to the, the GEM portal or something? All things ESSER are in that tile that that blue arrow is pointing to. Um, yeah, there no. There are some other tiles there. Some of you are in districts where we've had to, you've had to calculate maintenance of equity and all the information about those calculations and the reports that you, the, the outcome of those reports are, are there. But for the general general purpose audience, those of you who are interested in, in using the ESSER funds, you'll find the information under uh, that tile that says ESSER Elementary and Secondary School Relief Fund. And we also want to draw your attention to a, a interactive dashboard that's updated periodically that shows uh, the status of invoiced funds for the various funding sources. And here we have uh, CARES, CRISA, and ARP, which the main public schools are using. EANS is, um, is the non-public schools. Kevin Harrington is here and he can explain if you ever want to know or you can write to him to, to, to learn about what EANS is. And then there's uh, the donut that uh, provides a status of our total um, amount of inventory uses versus remaining funds in uh, all of the federal emergency funding sources. And there's also information uh, by district that you can um, look at and, um, you know, Understandably, people in your communities are going to be looking about it. There, you know, there have been a number of articles in the, in the um, national press and a little bit in Maine about, oh, these funds are not being used. Well, we know that it's because uh, the funds have yet to be invoiced, but, but just know that there are people who are very concerned about how these funds are being used, and we've provided a way for them to keep track of the status of um, usage of the funds. And this is about good news stories. Um, the main DOE is really looking to share stories of SAUs that are using their federal emergency relief funds um, to impact students and school communities. Uh, we know there's some wonderful, great things happening in our districts. And, um, you know, we we see them, we, hear, we have conversations with you guys, but we really would like to put that more on a broader scale. So, uh, we have a link here that's just a quick questionnaire that it's a Microsoft form and you just go on there and you talk about um, some of the wonderful things that you're doing with your ESSER money. So here are some uh, friendly reminders. The UEI number will never expire. However, uh, entity registrations do expire annu annually and require annual renewal. So, and reimbursement requests should be processed monthly, ideally, 
um, but cannot spend more than three months time. It cannot uh, overlap the uh, different fiscal years. Say for example, you are submitting an invoice for three months and it, uh, it, it includes June, 2023 through September 2023, June, July, August, August 2023. Even though the time is three month period, but it won't be allowable because it is overlapping two fiscal years because our fiscal year is July through June. So uh, that that needs to be um, taken, uh, you know, taken into our consideration. And we will not be um, able to process any invoice if the application is in, in open status. So it, the application needs to be approved before we can proceed to app, uh, approve the invoice or review the invoice. And please note that the reimbursement request should not be deleted once it is created on your side. Even if there is anything uh, that needs to be edited, you can go again and edit that and submit the invoice, but that form does, should not be deleted. It will convolute all the calculation on the back end. So that will create more work. Just like usual, I want to leave you with a few resources. I'm sure you're well aware of these resources. Uh, what we've done here is we've linked to directly to the homepage of the US Department of Ed for each of the funding sources because their ever evolving website has updates uh, every time there's a webinar or uh, the last FAQ was updated in December of 22. So we wanted to be sure you had the most up-to-date information. We do have some contact information should you need to get a hold of any members of our team. And I will leave that up, but I will also open it up to questions and answers. I think our teams tended to all the questions in the chat box, but we'd love to hear if you have some questions for us at this time. <laughs>